Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the first of our Patreon supporter entries for the 2021 Orchestration Challenge. So before I jump into this, <clears throat> this video is probably going to get a lot more views than normal just because it is the first of these individual entries. So I'm going to say a few words about the parameters of all of the Patreon entries. Each entrant is allowed to focus on or orchestrate any particular section that they like and have me evaluate that. In the case of these entries, it was really only one entrant that decided to orchestrate section D. So the rest of the entries will all be covering section A. And yes, I know that you normally would not put a rehearsal mark at the beginning of a piece, but this is just to help divide up the work into separate sections to make it easier for me to evaluate. <clears throat> I'll be evaluating things according to the criteria that is in the evaluations guide video. Go ahead and check that out. And I've also included the screen at the beginning of this video for your reference, which I'll do in the following Patreon supporter videos and the website subscriber entries. Now let's jump into Nick's score. So Nick, I really enjoyed your use of saxophones in this. I thought that was really, really fun. Of course, in a practical situation, it's very unlikely that an orchestra will spring for hiring four saxophone players to play work unless that work is really, really popular, like, say, uh, American in Paris is the usual example of multiple saxophones being a piece of normal repertoire. And even at that, it does not get performed as much as it should, right? And part of the obstacle is those saxophones. I think in that case, it's three saxophones rather than four. I'd have to refresh my memory on the exact amount, but I believe that's a trio of saxophones. So in this case, it's really nice to use this quartet. You've got soprano, alto, tenor, baritone. And yeah, I mean, it's really fun where you've got these all scored spread out across their range. And then you have them come back right in here. Now I'm gonna very quickly address the evaluation criteria, but I think the, the most important thing to talk about in this score is going to be texture balance and function and a bit of instrumentation. <clears throat> so as far as the pitch weight being stuck in the mid upper middle register of the piano for too long, you've addressed that by spreading out the harmony and some of the different functions across the orchestra. So that's really taken care of. As far as the Thematic material repeating quite often and possibly sounding repetitive uh, if, if orchestrated the same way, <clears throat> you didn't quite change things around that much. So that would be something I would say, if you do pursue this, you might want to consider. Maybe withholding certain elements the first time and then introducing them the second time so that it isn't just um, four pairs, or excuse me, two pairs of of two bar phrases. <clears throat> and, you know, especially if you are using very penetrating scoring in this, then it, it can get that much repetition of the same exact material orchestrated exactly the same way can get to be tiring to the ear or just, you know, just predictable. You handled some of the very high melodic development by dropping certain figures, certain passages. That's great. The accompaniment figures cover a wide range. You solved that by having it mostly in pizzicato lower strings. That's all cool. <clears throat> and as to addressing the upper middle register continuing on, and the relentless drive uh, to the next section. I will talk. I will talk about that in context with the other things that I need to talk to you about. So, you solved a lot of problems, 
maybe without thinking about them, maybe with giving them the same thought that I did. I'm not going to judge. I'm going to talk a little bit about the use of uh, second and third chair players <clears throat> with some caveats. So the first issue is giving your seconds, or you like say here your third player, um, a little bit of extra stuff. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that the first bassoon player would probably like to get more of the action. If there is an exposed line, if there is uh, an important role, it really is the first player who should be taking that role. And the second should be supporting the first. Here you've got a special situation where you're really pushing your first trumpet player up into the stratosphere here. <clears throat> and then you're asking the third player to do the same thing. Now, if you were doing this because you felt that, oh, well, I've asked all these high B flats from my first player, maybe I should give them a break and give it to the third now. That is actually the wrong thing to do. You have opened up the first player's lip and they should be the player who can handle those high notes the best, right? So their lip is in the right exact level of tension and they are ready to play a few more bars. Now, if you had a huge row of high C's or something, or high B flats, then yeah, split them between the players. But just these two bars is not enough to justify giving it to the third, who might have the most risk of cracking. Now, that leads to another particular issue, which is that did you really need to score your trumpets this high? Of course, this is a sounding G sharp because this is a transposing score and these are trumpets in B-flat. And that actually brings up another issue, and that is, did you score B-flat trumpets because you were working with saxophones that are scored in flats, right, that are B-flat and E-flat instruments? So if you did that, you should just know that that's really completely not necessary. Uh, you could have scored trumpets in C, very easy, G-sharp, written and sounding for that instrument. As to B-flat on a B-flat trumpet being more difficult, I don't think it necessarily is, but it, it it is just kind of not very characteristic in this kind of scoring to me to score for that sort of heavier sound, the heavier B-flat and pushing it really high. That's kind of more of a jazz thing. But... <clears throat> It, in any case, it doesn't really matter because it's going to be the trumpet player's choice and possibly the section leader's choice as to what kind of trumpets the orchestra is going to use. So perhaps it's immaterial. But back to the previous point about not really needing to push your trumpet player so high. When you think about it, uh, putting this much focus, right? You, you know, you're trying to fill this in, right? I, I totally see what you are trying to do here. You are building a chord out of saxophones and trumpet, right? So you have that voice right in the middle, but there's that risk that the trumpet player is going to drown out your saxophonist because this is concert scoring, not jazz scoring, right? It's not a... <clears throat> what you have here is not a jazz quintet of horns, uh, jazz horns, which include saxophones and uh, and heavy brass, <clears throat> as we understand it in the concert realm, and actually no actual concert horns. So that those players have a certain balance and they have a certain kind of force to their playing. And it is a bit reminiscent of what you're doing right in here, but it still isn't the same thing. You're throwing in some clarinets right in here to underline, uh, right, to underline those sounding Bs, right? And you're doing a lot of enharmonic scoring, which is kind of fun. But, you know, I still feel you're going to have a lot of force and a lot of penetration right in here. And then Right in here, you've got the reaction, dun, 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 and it is really not very strong. 
compared to everything else going on. I almost wonder whether or not you could have scored <clears throat> this with clarinets and oboes and filled in some of those positions without bringing in the trumpets and then had, every, had the trumpets come in and combine with flutes and oboes or strings or some other kind of combination and played bum 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 as a reaction rather than bringing the trumpet right in here because in concert scoring it's not going to be as balanced. Of course they can balance uh, but you know I, I mean I would be tempted to write in like forte here rather than fortissimo because fortissimo for a trumpet player on a high note a fortissimo isn't just a level of volume right it isn't just turning the dial up it is also a certain kind of very penetrating timbre it, it you, you know there that's the one of the things i'm going to focus on in my long delayed uh, 105 to 107 courses is that i mean this is true for any instrument of course but so much so for brass instruments that that dynamics are as timbral as they are um, dynamic right they the the dynamics especially affect the timbre so that is another reason why it might be wise to score something forte in the brass while you've got fortissimo with everybody else because that that adjustment of the timbre really does blend better in certain tutties. Now here <clears throat> you have a very unique problem to the way that you're scoring and that is that you've got very high horns. Now horns have a different kind of harmonic overtone than the heavy brass and that harmonic overtone tends to blot out those things that you need to hear with your ear that make saxophones intelligible right so you've thrown in uh, high bassoons clarinets kind of doubling on this and you've got the you got the i feel the function right in here is not exactly it doesn't really evoke what's in the piano score very well so um but you know forgive me it's not a it's not a value judgment but it's just a it's something that I think you would need to work on, but you know, you want that bum 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 da 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 idea. Okay, so so fair enough. <clears throat> but I, I feel that like the tail end of this is not a melodic note, right? It is the end of a run, right? So yeah, I, I, it, it's it doesn't quite add up together. Um, in terms of the way that it's being realized, but it's okay. Um, so you've got forte, you've got accents, you've got marcato on this, you've got accented tenuto. So you could probably hear in that the mock-up there that it was very hard to hear the saxophones, and that is true. That is exactly what is going to happen there. Unless these saxophones were supported by trumpets or something, I don't think that it would really come through as clearly as you intend. So pushing the horns that high it just really deletes part of the uh, uh, part of the spectrum that the saxophones need to sit in so so you know that is a that is a an issue of both texture and balance right that that the timbre needs to leave space so those are my issues with those portions of this scoring the, the the percussion is all right. The harp is almost inaudible. There's there's like these low, you know, guitar-like. I think what you mean is uh, près de la table. So that's like playing close to the bridge. But even at that, the pizzicato from the lower strings is going to obliterate the harp. So you're not going to be able to hear the harp. And then right in here, the um, this kind of staccato playing from from the harp, it's not really going to come through because the xylophone is going to just swallow anything that you know any any overtones any part of the attack of the harp that you could really make out and would make it worthwhile to throw harp in there 
same thing in here. So the, the, the putting xylophone and harp together, the xylophone player wins, right? It just becomes a, the xylophone dominant and the harp is just somewhere in the background where they can't really be heard. I like the idea of combining uh, spiccato strings. I think what you mean here is uh, saltato, saltando. Okay, so that probably would be, yeah, might be, uh, that just would, has the idea of the bounce in it a little clearer, right? So I would just say, forget about bouncing parentheses spiccato, say, uh, just say saltando or S-A-L-T period. And then that will be completely clear if it isn't already just by the articulations. Now, right in here, just score a regular octave on the same stem and then put the parentheses above and everybody knows that what that means. You don't have to put a, you don't need to define it for your bass players. They will know immediately and if they don't just throw in the higher D already if you didn't score the option because you know they might only have a four string bass without a C, C extension. So, okay, all right. So one other little feature right in here that is not going to work the way that you think, and that is writing in a double stop on timpani. So I have a whole chapter in 100 More Orchestration Tips about timpani double stops. So go read that. And it's, it's just that the, uh, the lower tone tends to get absorbed by the upper tone. So it would be better to figure out which pitch you feel is most important to have the emphasis of timpani on it, score that pitch, and then just have the other pitch doubled in pizzicato, right? It very firmly. And that will get you the effect that you are looking for. I, th I think that that is a safer way to go than to write a, you know, the, I mean, yeah, you'll, it's fine, but it's just not going to give you, it's not going to deliver what you need unless there is huge emphasis by other instruments. Uh, scoring a sixth in a double stop, about the only really effective place that I've seen that was in the planets. And I have an example where I'm still a little dubious on it, but it does work because both of those pitches are really hugely being emphasized in the music. And so... Uh, they are a little clearer because of that doubling, because of that emphasis, because of that, you know, there's, there is an expectation of it. But in this case, it's very exposed, and the actual exposure is going to just make it about the fact that the G-sharp is going to, to ring out and the B is not really going to contribute a whole lot. Okay, <clears throat> so... Um, those are my thoughts on this. I like the idea of the castanets in here. Bass drum, I like the emphasis in there. So yeah, so this, so yeah, just don't don't count on the harp being able to compete in really furious passages. Don't count on the harp being able to really sound clearly while there is a xylophone running around on top of it. And and of course, like doubling these pizzicato pitches, pizzicato will just absorb the sound of the harp into it. So you're kind of asking the harpist to do a lot of stuff in here that's difficult. There's the other issue, too, and that is that harpists ha are, are built differently. And very often the harpist can have a smaller frame um, because there are a lot of people who are playing harp um, who... You, know, you don't have that far of a reach, okay? And that means that it's difficult for some harp players, not all harp players, to really reach all the way across to be able to play complicated things like this in octaves. So it's, it's better, like in this case, I would, I would score this as octaves for the left hand because there's really kind of no need for both hands to be playing. It, it doesn't make it any louder or softer. Right, and then the same thing right in here. I would give this low note to the left hand, and then have the right hand pick up right in here. It's just easier. 
I've heard stories from harpists of them reaching over the top of the harp and playing in that way, which is very strange looking, in order to play two-handed passages on the lowest couple of octaves. So just watch out. Don't score a lot of involved things for in both hands for very low notes. I would say make the lowest note for your right hand uh, this G and you're pretty safe, right? Just not all harpists have very, very long arms and can play way, way out there at the end. So that is my evaluation of your score. And this is really a delightful way to start the Patreon supporter entries. Uh, you know, it, it, <clears throat> it is a constant, um, <laughs> It is a constant, delightfully uh, perplexing conundrum to me that my fellow musicians are able to support this kind of thing on Patreon. And, you know, we musicians have some of the most unpredictable finances <laughs> of any kind of job out there. And on top of that, being a composer, and dedicating your life to this in a creative way it, that is doubly unpredictable and you know it, it i just really feel blessed i feel honored when somebody is to, able to support me at any level so um i, I really appreciate it thank you nick uh, thank you to all of my supporters out there who are watching this and and you know I'm going to be adding more videos soon to our Patreon feed um, <laughs> alongside some of these evaluations that I hope are going to be really fun to watch and will be very instructive, especially if you're into film or game music. Thanks, everybody. Now on to the next evaluation. <laughs>